Great. So we'll just give it a couple minutes for people to join and then we'll we'll kick this off. Actually, I don't want to be cheating, so I might stop the uh, I'm gonna stop the share. All right, let's go ahead and get started because early is on time and on time is late. So let's start this out a little bit differently. We're thinking about panel design and fluorescence and hopefully everyone, everyone can hear me otherwise just, uh, just give me a chat here. Um, and I want you to start actually by counting the number of Fs that are in this sentence. So I'll give you a minute to do that. Just the Fs, nothing else. And how many do you, how many are you seeing? How many Fs are you seeing? Right? I mean, we're all are pretty experienced at counting events. Are you seeing three Fs? Are you seeing these, these Fs, these the sort of the obvious Fs, the ones that are starting words? And that's what most people count. They usually count three. And what most people are missing, me included every time, almost every time I've done this now, is there's actually six Fs. And there's six Fs in this because we read of as O-V, right? We read it as the sound and the shape of the word rather than actually the, the letter F, right? So this is, I think this is a great example of heuristics, right? Where we're actually using these simple, efficient rules, whether it be the shape of a word or the sound of a word, right? And we use that as an efficient rule, which we use to form judgments and make a decision, right? We made a decision, there's three Fs in that, right? Even though we're counting events all day, very simple exercise, very difficult to, to say, yes, there's six Fs in the sentence. And I think, you know, Amos and Tversky, who got a Nobel Prize based on this work, all of these heuristics lead to these systematic deviations from logic, probability, or rational choice theory. And I think it's that, it's that notion of rational choice that we'll focus a little bit on. But another, I think, great example of heuristics is actually the way that we currently think about panel design, right? Which is essentially a set of rules that we've put together to deal with the compromises of some of the underlying fluorescence technology, right? So when we think about both the spectral overlap accommodating for antigen density, accommodating for spillover spreading, and thinking about a staining index of a dye or any of the other metrics that we've tried to put together, right? If it be similarity indexes or any of these other ind indices to try and make panel design easier, what we find, right, is that the majority of them, really with the exception of antigen density, are all affected by the underlying dye performance and properties. And in fact, hopefully I'll try and convince you today too that even panel design itself is essentially subject to the compromises of these foundational dyes that we've had in the field for many, many years. And so we're gonna try and think differently around that. So stay with me while we sort of think about what are current dyes, we'll try and focus that in on a particular set of laser lines, which is where we started, and then we'll build out that paradigmatically, both from labels into panel design, and then describe some current work on going very, very high plexity, high number of questions around each individual cell. And so we think about dye performance, we can sort of think about this in a laser line specific way, right? We've got all these, we have these available lasers where we'll focus our attention today actually will be within the B, the blue and the yellow green lasers because that's really where we started because we saw a fundamental problem with PE and some of these PE conjugates. And, and really the, the, the fact is, is you buy a four laser instrument and an immediately, or a five laser instrument and immediately becomes a four laser instrument once you actually start using it thanks to their performance, which will describe the cross excitation and also the spread characteristics of these labels. But we'll, for a moment, we'll actually set aside the DPUV because there's really no labels to date in the DPUV, very, very few 
that deep UV lasers and UV lasers out there. And then really there's only the zombie and IR viability die in the IR. But all of the, you know, all the labels that we've seen in here are, you know, suffer from cross excitation and spray. We'll actually comment, uh, I'll comment quite a bit too on some of these other labels that we've had in the field. And really, frankly, they, you know, the blue excited dyes, for instance, dumping into the violet, violet dyes dumping into the UV. And also comment too around, well, what does that mean in terms of thinking around signatures versus just clean fluorescence? But again, we'll focus today on this BYG space. And the reason that we focus there really is because of some of these foundational dyes that are excited off of these lasers, be they particularly the phycoerythrin conjugates or, or PCP. Um, and thinking around, or sorry, PCP is, is bleeding into YG, but really thinking around the amount of spread that has been contributed by these dyes that are excited in these lasers and the fact that you really can't use these lasers together on most instrumentation. And so when we think about what that means, and it means in the context of thinking about this, but also thinking about it in the context of what does that mean in terms of, well, only the signature matters, is that, you know, we, we Sort of, we, we love looking at these ribbon plots because it actually kind of illustrates a lot of, around dive performance, right? And this is amazing work from, from the SciTech team in, in sort of characterizing a lot of these labels. And, and I've, I've taken this, this image from them and shown, look, we've got, it's great, PE and all these PE conjugates have this behavior. They have this great bright fluorescence in the primary detector. But the fact is, is that without a doubt, you can't get away from the fact that this fluorescence is adding spread into a huge number of other channels, right? And so it's not, I, you know, I'd sort of caution you to say, yeah, it's great that we can distinguish this lot labels from other one. It's great that we have this bright dye, but there's really no magic in the sense that it's always going to add spread to a huge number of channels, including the violet and the UV, right? And so ideally you would actually, in an ideal scenario, you'd have a very, very bright dye in the primary channel of interest and actually have very, very low cross excitation so that you didn't contribute spread into all their panels, right? This makes analysis easier. It makes panel design a heck of a lot easier. And it means you can actually leverage the full capabilities of the instrument, right? And it's the same thing when we go into the blue excited dyes, right? Whether it be per CP, right? Which is not very bright, but has a huge spread contribution. The brilliant blues, which we'll actually do a head to head with uh, later on in this talk, um, huge spread contributions everywhere. And I would say notably in the violet and the UV, uh, you know, a space that we'd all like to be leveraging a little bit more. Um, but unfortunately, we sort of have careened and use that as a dumping ground uh, for, for spread. And you, know, you can see this in the analysis of data where it gets much more difficult because of what we've built on top of, if you will, sort of our backbone fluorescence. A final piece, and you know, this, is, this is very standard, is you know, the way that we even think about panel design is conditioned by what we've got access to, be they the PE or APC conjugates, right? And we essentially just deal with the compromises because of the brightness that these give to us, right? So we just say, okay, we're gonna stack low antigen density with high brightness, and we'll just deal with, you know, PEs, idiosyncrasies, right? And so we'll think a little bit differently today around the notion of brightness, the ability to tune it, and the ability to leverage brightness really across the, uh, the entire spectrum with a focus in on this, with a focus in on a, a particular space and some, some brand new data that I'll show you around the ability to actually tune brightness for fluorescent labels, right? So I guess one of the things we'll say is just unfreeze for today in the way that we've thought around fluorescence is from fluorescence technology and even the way we think around panel design. And so the second, I think, you know, there's the count the Fs. The second question is really, what if you could design a fluorescent label from scratch, right? Just start over and just say, we're not gonna start with this base technology. We're gonna move to a completely different system. And given that, what would panel design be, right? What would an ideal, floor four look like, what would be the implications of that, you know, for flow cytometry and panel design? And I think if you were sort of dreaming up a, a label, a fluorescent label, and we talked to a number of different customers about this, right, at Cyto, and then and since then, we, we actually asked them this, and we said, what, what would it be? And we learned a lot, it was really, it was really interesting. The first one, it's pretty obvious to most of us, is what we've been talking about for a good portion of the beginning of this, which is they would be bright and they would be clean, right? But notably, they'd be silent in the violet, right? They would not add any contribution to spread. And in fact, ideally, they wouldn't spread anywhere else. There would be limited or zero cross laser excitation. So we could actually think about stacking laser lines and really maxing out the number of questions that we could ask, or even on, on any instrument, just having a cleaner data there because of, of less cross laser excitation, right? Less spreading, easier analysis. A second one that was an emergent one that I found really interesting um, that we've done some studies on and I'll show you some data on today is actually this notion, notion of consistency and stability. So specifically with respect to stability, people are really interested in, okay, well, is it stable on a bench? 
how are you manufacturing it, right? How, how is it lot to lot? And you'll see we're relying on very standard oligo manufacturing to actually make our labels. And so I'll describe that in a minute. And the stability, I think, will be very interesting for you, for you to see. We've got some, some very intriguing data there on the fact is you can just leave our labels out on a bench or fix them for very long periods of time, which I think kind of changes the way we think around fluorescent labels a little bit. The final part is controllable brightness, right? So instead of having to choose the brightest labels that are PE or APC or you know, that are compromised, we would actually be able to control that. And we would say, for this color, I want it to be this bright. And I would say we're, we're trying to push that a little bit further and we'll describe this uh, a little bit later is how low can we go in terms of limit of detection if we do have tunable brightness and we have it in various places in the spectrum. So I'll show you data across all of these, right? Shouldn't take my word for it. So what are we gonna be talking about today? What's the technology platform on which we've based all of this? And the technology we we've based this on is the, the, a platform that we call the phyton. And the way we make these phytons is we take single-stranded oligonucleotides that have small component organic uh, uh, dyes that are actually attached to them. And then we can fold them into this artificial DNA structure, which has this cruciform. It's about 20 nanometers across, so 120 kilodaltons. Although that belies the fact that actually DNA actually has this natural curvature. What's very interesting about this for what it's worth is that it stabilizes all of the label interactions, right? So if you, for instance, put a tandem um, on one of the arms of this structure, you can stabilize it spatially and engineer down to the sub nanometer level the way that those are interacting, right? So actually we've done that for the, for the six labels that we'll talk about today. And we can, actually, we can actually tune to get very, very efficient fret because the distance of that interaction is a critical component in actually the efficiency of that transfer and the efficiency of controlling the way that you'll see these things perform optically. The other part of this structure that I can find very interesting, it's because of this curvature and because of the cationic nature of DNA is that it in essence acts as a solubility cage. So it solubilizes dyes that really haven't been either, either haven't been used before or have very, very weak solubility, um, but it means that it's very, very stable in solution. And I'll say, show you some results around that. And the final part of this is of course, then we can conjugate that to an antibody and I'll describe the means by which we do that. But the fact is it's an oligo-based platform, so you can probably kind of guess at what we're doing in terms of being able to put oligos onto the FC region of an antibody and then put these phytons on. But I think one very interesting thing that we've been working towards too is how do you tightly control that? Because we have a very quantitative system. We know exactly how many component dyes are on a phyton. We know how many phytons should go onto an antibody. What this platform enables us to do is tunable excitation and emission tunable brightness and tunable signatures. And I'll show you data across all three today. But it's stable, it's proven. It's also say, we've also, you know, we have the ability to manufacture very consistently because it's just based on standard oligo manufacturing and do that already at scale, right? Which is why we're already, why we're already offering conjugation uh, products. We're already offering a CD4 kit for this. We already have all of that lined up to be able to service uh, particularly these six colors, but as you can imagine how we're moving uh, uh, beyond that rather quickly. I'd say the final piece of this platform that's been probably one of the most fun parts about it is the ability to rapidly develop new fluorescent labels, right? So we're actually scaling up our effort to produce a huge number of fluorescent labels. Actually, the way we think about it is per month, right? So not three or four years to do organic chemistry, but how many can we do this month, right? And so we've actually built the team to be able to do that. So I'm excited. It's a very, it's a developing story, but uh, a very fun one. So the first six labels are what the, the, and the six that we'll talk about in terms of both panel design and then very and, and large panels and, and tunable brightness will be these six labels. Three in the three excited by the blue and three excited by the yellow or green laser. And the first thing you can see if you just look at these labels, and I'll show you some other special viewers that we've that we published, um, is that we can actually step the show, stoke shift of these dyes along. But also if you note where the blue is excited here, it's separate from where the, the blue, the yellow green excitation is occurring. Right. So if I overlay this with three yellow dyes, you can actually see right that I'm actually separating that cross excitation right off the bat. Right. And so we're actually able to, to tune that that excitation and then tune the emission. So this is for these six labels. And again, we'll carry these through. But for what it's worth, you know, it's, it's always it's, you know, it's hard to explore spectra when they're just sitting up on a PowerPoint slide. So we've got two different there's two different resources that you can use to explore these. Actually, there are other people, spectral viewers and say, oh, we're excited honestly that they put them put, put these uh, publish these labels up on them the first uh, is this this resource called FP base is an open source spectral viewer you can actually look at our labels in the context of in vivo dyes or a huge library of floor force it's also just a good resource um, because it is open source and you can view this this large library of floor force 
I'd say, you know, uh, it's been also been really fantastic to see our labels be posted up on the site, the SciTech Full Spectrum Viewer. You can actually look at the Novas, and I'll show you an example of this in very high uh, parameter panel design later, where we've literally dropped these into a, a, a very large panel um, and can think about how you can leverage this clean fluorescence. But you can appreciate immediately the way that we're thinking and the way that we want to create these labels, which is to be incredibly clean and to stack, if you will, these lasers, right? So you can see that right off the bat, just how clean these are, right? And there's certainly some notion around the signature or the ability to separate these from others that are falling within that primary detector channel, experiments in progress. But I think that's what's really compelling about the use of these labels is just how cleanly excited, cleanly emitting they are. And notably, as we'll talk about later, very, very quiet in the violet in the UV. And so the first, you know, the first thing would be, well, how do these, how, okay, that's all great, but how do they compare against current dyes and how do they compare, you know, when we're looking at things like separation index or stain index um, and, and you know, just how are they, how are they performing? And so what we did is uh, we got our, our labels uh, uh, to Steve Perfetto at the NIH and we said, you know, throw the kitchen sink against these things. And so we provided him anti-CD4 and Nova Yellow 610 Actually, in this regime, it's actually just one phyton and one antibody together. So it's actually a quantitative system and anti-CD8 with Nova Blue 610. And they ran a, a huge number of studies. So individually stated beads and cells, really performance testing versus a huge number of dyes, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, you know, looking at that, looking also at, at, at spillover spreading and then also the notion of brightness. And so this was the performance characteristics. It was run, uh, this performance characteristic was run on a five laser X50, a, a symphony, uh, across beads and, and PBMCs. And you can see really, I mean, the, the huge number of comparisons up against the CD4, Nova Yellow, so all of those other labels conjugated to CD4. Um, and we'll particularly touch on the, the, the spillover spreading uh, results for that yellow dye. And then uh, uh, we will so certainly also focus on an apples to apples comparison for Nova Yellow 610 versus other yellow excited dyes. And then the Nova Blue, uh, particularly uh, an apples to apples comparison to this brilliant blue 630 prototype dye. Um, and what does that performance characteristics look like? So this is actually, this is a, the, the first sort of performance metric that you can take a look at, which is how are these, how did this stack up, right? So if we look at Nova Blue in this lighter, lighter blue color and brilliant blue uh, uh, 630 uh, in, in, in this darker blue color, you can see immediately, yes, it's a, it is a dimmer dye in the primary channel. And I would say put a pin in that because we can actually tune that brightness up. But notably, it's incredibly quiet in the violet, right? And has much less, much less cross excitation in the green. And so, you know, while it is, might be a dim label, it's incredibly cleanly emitting. And so you'll see, I'll present these plots in, the, in this fashion where we've got all the blue detectors, violet, UV, red, and, and then, uh, then the number of detectors off the green. Another comparison, uh, lots more apples to apples in, in this case of Nova Yellow 610 because of, of where it's detected off of this green laser, but we compared it to a Lexus 694. This PE conjugate, CF594 PE dazzle, right? A very bright conjugate, as, as we'll see a very messy conjugate. And then also this ECD dye from Beckman. And we're looking here at what it looks like in the primary detector. And so when you look at the primary detector, I think what you see that's quite interesting is that this Nova Yellow dye, even with just one phyton on one antibody, is already brighter than or as bright as all three of these floor fours. But what's also critically important is that it's much quieter across the spectrum, right? Because of this notion of tunable excitation and emission, right? So incredibly clean in the violet if you look across all of these labels, right? Or even actually less, you know, even though it might be brighter in the case of comparing to something like ECD, it actually emits much, much less in the, into the blue. And I think this is really interesting when we think about, you know, the characteristics of, of these yellow dyes. But another, I think, really important piece, and I'm just, I'm just showing the values for the, for the apples to apples here, is that when you look at this Nova Yellow dye, that the spillover spreading error was lower than every other label that was measured on bead. So all the other 30 labels that I showed you, it had the best spectral spillover performance. So it's brighter than those currently commercially available labels that are in channel, and it's got better spillover spreading performance across the entire, across the entire cytometer, right? And then in an apples to apples comparison, Nova Blue is much, much better than this brilliant Blue 630, Again, in that case, you'd expect that based on the data that I just showed you and some of that, some of the notion around cross excitation. But I thought really impressive, right? We're able to go in there and we can see, for instance, we need to tune up the brightness perhaps in the blue, but the Novial is already performing exactly how we would like to see it perform in flow. And it's much, much cleaner. So what does it mean for the biology, right? Because I think it's very interesting when you get into the notion of brightness, what does that really mean? 
And the way that we've looked at it is certainly there's brightness and there's also separation and then there's spillover, right? So it's how, do the, how does that all mix together, right? So we also looked at separation index. So this is the ability to actually separate CD4, CD8 T cells, very similar calculation to staining index. In this case, we're just sort of taking the delta of the positive and negative population, the medians, and then actually taking a look at that versus this 84th percentile. So very similar to the stain index calculation, but a little bit more relevant to, to the underlying biology. Can you actually separate it? And also remember, this takes into account background, right, which is quite important, right? So how much is that background contributing to your ability to separate out the CD4s and CD8s? So you have a lower background, but you're dimmer, you still have a good separation index. And in this case, you can see that both Nova Blue and this Nova Yellow dye actually have the exact same separation ind index as APC. So on a brightness measure, it being separation index, they're both already performing the same way as APC. So we're thinking about, okay, well, what's the best way to think around brightness and communicating this notion of, of clean fluorescence? And have what, you know, what does that do for your underlying analysis? And so we came up with this, we're calling it the lab mate plot. And so what we do is we actually can take the total spillover spreading error, put that on the X and put the separation index on the Y. And the reason we call it the lab mate plot is because you don't want a lab mate that is dim and messy or bright but messy. You really want a lab mate that's bright and clean. They keep their bench really clean, right? And they're smart and they can help you with your experiment. That would really be an ideal lab mate and an ideal fluorescent label. And so Nova Blue 610 really fits into this dim but clean uh, arena and the yellow, and in fact, all the, particularly all the yellow excited dyes fit into this both bright and clean matrix, whereas the other apples, apples comparisons really fall, fall away from that. And I'll show you what the fluorescence actually of all of the labels looks like in a moment when we get into panel design, because we've got some, particularly this Nova Blue 530, which is essentially a fantasy dye. It only emits uh, into the channel that, which, it, which it's designed to do. And it actually has essentially zero fluorescence in all the other channels. So it's, it's incredibly clean. So what about stability? This is the second point, right? So we've captured bright and clean. I've talked around silent and a violet. We've got the spectra on that, some performance characteristics, but what about stability? And so we did some very honestly simple experiments. And the first one was shipping, you know, three days across the country, you get a, get a temperature gauge well over hundred degrees with, without any ice, was there any change? We see a 9% drop in ship without ice. Um, and we're shipping with ice anyway, um, but you know, very much not even, not even really detectable on a flow cytometer. But I think the more impressive result, and it was one that we got pushed to do because of high throughput studies, but also because you know, sometimes graduate students and postdocs, maybe they leave labels out on the bench, is we literally just left our labels out on the bench. And so we've actually tested this out to three weeks, which is just the longest that we've tested. But you can see that whether it's one, two, or in three weeks, which I'm not showing here, there's actually no difference at all in the spectral characteristics of the brightness of the floors, right? So you can literally leave them out on a bench. That's how stable they are. And for what it's worth, these are conjugated, this is conjugated product. This is conjugated to an antibody. So you just leave it on a bench. So we wanna take this one step further, which was, okay, well, that's, that's really good stability, right? That, that bodes very well for running high throughput studies in this without the, you know, there being no drift over the, or over the course of either a high throughput or a longitudinal study. What about also fixation? What about this living on cells? And so what we did is we just did a very simple experiment. We stained T cells, we conjugated Noviola 610 to CD3. Um, this is one, one cluster, so it's just actually off, just for fluorescence off one of the arms uh, of the phyton. And we just said, okay, well, that's what fresh looks like. That's great. What happens if we actually fix them very simply in a 1% PFA solution? And can we come back and what does the fluorescence look like? And the answer is it's the same. And so call this kind of jokingly the, the lazy graduate student experiment, but you can fix your cells and there's actually no change in the brightness, right? So this is a fixed antibody on cells. And for what it's worth, there's nothing special about any of the buffers. There's no special buffers at all for anything that I've shown you. This is in PBS on a bench. This was a very standard 1% PFA fixation and then it was stored in PBS. So there's no special buffers that you need to do this and you can do it in combination as well. So there's no, again, there's no magic that, that's in this. It's literally just being stored at, you know, as you store your cells. So then another, I think incredibly exciting part, some brand new data to share with you, you know, literally hot off the, I'd say the press, but it's hot off the flow cytometer as of about two, three weeks ago, is this notion around tunable brightness and the ability to stoichiometrically control brightness for any color. So how do we, how do, we do that? How does it compare to what's out there? And so the terminology we've come up with for these arms on the phyton is this notion of clusters. 
So we'd have a one cluster label or two cluster label. And uh, we had shown some results around what two cluster may have looked like at, you know, at Cyto. We've got some more data to show. But the one that we were really reaching for was actually fully loading this, this Phyton structure, essentially up to near its quenching limit, right? And so that's why I'm excited around this yes indeed, because this is our four cluster label. And really the goal is, can you get PE like brightness, but get it in any part of the spectrum? Is that possible? So let's try and answer that. So the first part of this is, can you replicate a network, right? Can you net replicate the network of floor fours that's on one side of your phyton, put it on another cluster of the phyton? And the answer is yes, right? Because if you think about the phyton, it's essentially asymmetric along the y equal, or it's asymmetric along the y equals x axis, right? And so you can actually move that over. So we can prove that, and it actually doesn't change the spectral characteristics, right, of, of, the, of, the, uh, of the fluorescence. But what this enables us to do, because you can replicate, is then you can tune brightness, right? So now we have a one cluster versus a two cluster. And we see at least by spec, it's twice as bright. Well, that's all great, right? And as I always say, spectral plots are great in terms of what we can see off the spec, but I really wanna see it in flow. So that's what we did. So what we did is we took this NOAA blue dye, which you remember was, was, was a dimmer dye, but much better performing uh, than some of the brilliant blues and said, okay, well, it doesn't need to be brighter. Let's go and do that. So let's create a two cluster label out of this NOVA blue, out of this NOVA blue dye. So what we did is conjugated to CD3 we, we ran an FMO, right? That way, you know, everyone would, would be happy on, on the Purdue list. They wouldn't say, where's your FMO? And then we also ran label only, right? So this is actually Phyton, Phyton on its own. You can actually, because, you know, a quick question could be, does it bind to cells? And the answer is no, very, very, very low background here. Um, and what we did is, again, we conjugated to this uh, anti-CD3 and then stained either the, with Phytons, Phytons on antibodies that had one cluster or those that had two clusters. And it's hard to make out here, but it's much easier to make out in the, in the histogram, is what we actually see is that it is indeed twice as bright, right? So if we compare the one cluster to the two cluster, again, this is on a, on a logarithmic scale, it is in fact twice as bright. So we can actually tune the brightness of these labels. And there's a lot of interesting conversations around what that could mean in terms of, what does that mean in terms of panel design? And then also, could you even bring some sort of plex within a channel, right? But I'd say for now, what we've done is proven out the fact that we can tune the brightness of these. What we've gone with is actually uh, uh, with, with what we've got in the conjugation kit and what we're, what we're putting together uh, uh, as part of the CD4 kits and some, some other projects we're working on is all on this two cluster because we think it provides really excellent brightness compared to current floor fours. But let's, can we push beyond that, right? This would just be, this would be great. We'd have dyes that are just as bright, but can we go brighter, right? We go much, much brighter. And you think about it, we're going much, much brighter, but also not changing size, right? The phyton st structure is, is, is fixed in terms of size. And I think this is really exciting because what we're able to do now is actually go from a two cluster to a four cluster label. And so we've proven that out. We did it on the you know, a yellow 610 dye. That was actually with an intent. We already knew that 610 was bright. And the reason we did this is because we wanted to know, is it possible for us to push the limit of detection of flow cytometry if we're able to do this? We'll describe actually two controls I have on brightness. And, and what, what might be possible there. And that's trying to, something we're trying to determine really between now and, and, and the next cycle. Um, but with this four cluster Nova, Nova Yellow 610, we are actually in fact, almost twice as bright, right? And actually what's interesting about this is that the normalized result actually shows that the performance of, of, that, uh, uh, of that four cluster is actually quite a bit better than the two cluster, right? Uh, at least when you're looking at less, less spillover. So it's an incredibly high performing, high brightness label. But of course, what you're waiting for, right, is well, how bright is it? <laughs> and how does it compare to PE, right? The brightest, if you will, you know, star that's in the sky. And so try to answer that question here. So what we've got here again is this Noviel 610, two cluster, four cluster, right? And in this case, we're just looking at median fluorescence intensities here. And we can in fact see, yes, it is, the four cluster is in fact twice as bright. In this case, they're conjugated to CD4. But how does it compare? What does that look like on an MFI basis? So this two cluster on a one phyton within its primary channel, 12,000, nearly 13,000 on an MFI, right? Although I would say notably, as you'd expect, very, very clean fluorescing, right? Very, uh, uh, very, low, uh, very low fluorescence in other channels. And the four cluster is at about you know, 23,000, right? Again, MFI, just looking at this, at this comparison here. And then if you look at PE, which can have anywhere from one to two or on an antibody, whereas this is just one phyton on one antibody, up at around 91,000, right? So the four cluster is 1.84 times brighter than the two cluster in flow cytometry. 
we're saying it exhibits PE light brightness because we can remember we can actually also change the number of these phytons that are on an antibody. So if you needed it to quite literally be PE bright, we could just put more phytons on the antibody, which I'll show in a moment. Um, and we also, what's also equally important about this though, is that you have tunable brightness with very clean fluorescence. So it makes it analyzable. It makes it doable with other channels. And you could also use multiple of these together in the same panel. So I think that's exciting. As is the ability to actually have very, very bright labels in other parts of the spectrum other than just PE and APC or their conjugates. And so let's tackle this notion of how do you, what two ways do you have to control brightness? And we, we do. And so the first one, which I've shown you is this ability for clusters, right? And I mean, everything I've shown you today has been this notion of one phyton, one antibody, tune the brightness up on that, just using the number of clusters, right? And the second part of this is what about the degree of labeling? That's also something that we have control over because of the conjugation that we have, um, where we can actually tune, if you will, the number of phytons that end up on antibody. So we have two controls of the volume knob here, right? And it really depends on, okay, well, what's the application and what are you really looking to get, to get after on this? But again, in every case, you're getting that very, very clean fluorescence, low, low spillover spreading. And for what it's worth, our conjugation, right, is putting a single stranded oligo onto an antibody and then binding the complementary strand off of the phyton. So it comes off one of the arms of the phyton, right? It's led to very interesting conversations around, okay, well, what, what does that mean in terms of sort of combined workflows, et cetera? Um, but I think what's important here, focusing in on how we, yeah, we have two controls on brightness. So we've really proven out really these three requirements of, is it, can you create fluorescent labels that are bright and clean? Yes, across the current six labels, sound and violet, we've limited that cross laser excitation. Are they consistent and stable? Yes, and at this point, we're just waiting on more time to test these out, right? But they're incredibly consistent and stable. And then we do have the ability to control brightness, and we're actually building out that controllable brightness now across all the different labels that you've seen today. But I think it puts us in this mind of, well, what does that mean for panel design? What could we do now? Could we actually choose brightness based on antigen density, right? Could we think about that a little bit differently? And so we'll touch on that in a moment. But the other thing that we did, and I'd say it's, it's very early days for thinking about this, but there's been a lot of talk around, well, what is the signature of a dye? You know, right now we're dealing with the signatures of dyes because the dye underlying dye performance isn't very good. But our question was, again, kind of back to this notion of like, could you design it? What if you could design a signature? And that's exactly what we did. So we created these four spectral signature dyes in two weeks, just based on what we knew about how the how our, 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 our phytons were working. And you can actually say, you can design these spectral labels really from scratch. And so you know, I think transparently there's a lot of biology that stands between us and you using these, you know, uh, uh, as, as, as sort of bona fide floor fours for, for markers, but we have this capability to produce these spectral dots. So we've got to talk about panel design. I kicked it off with that. I talked about heuristics. You guys know how to do conventional panel design in terms of mapping antigen density to brightness. But, you know, I thought, I was taking a step back on this, really thinking around, you know, I've, I've analyzed a, a good amount of data and seen a ton of data at this point and thought around this panel design of like, man, wouldn't it be better if we could think about the analysis much, much sooner in this and have that clean fluorescence, have those separation of populations. So what would that mean, again, if you have the ability to do that and think about that earlier? So I think conventional panel design definitely achieves to even out positive signals. It definitely increases the chances of positive negative population. That's about it. Um, and it deals with the compromises of current dice fine. It misses cross excitation for broadly absorbing labels, right? It's what you see is what you get. You got to deal with that. It misses spillover from noisy labels. And the result is this difficulty of data analysis, right? Because I mean, honestly, for most people, once you buy the panel, you know, good luck, right? Um, if you've got hard to separate populations, well, that's, that's on you. So we asked the question, which is how do you design a panel? you go from scratch and throw this paradigm out and say, well, what if you design a panel that actually minimize cross excitation spillover a priori, right? And so what we did as a challenge was we created a TBNK kit, a TBNK panel for ourselves, leveraging the, the, the current floor force that we had, right? And we compared that to this commercial TBNK kit with the conventional floor force that are out there. And it just mapped up in terms of the number of, of labels that we had. Um, and it gave us the ability to think about how could panel design be a little bit different. And so this is actually some data that I mentioned I was going to share earlier, which is what did, this is us just, we actually just ran this on an, on an Attune, which is actually where you've seen a lot of the flow cytometry results from our side. 
Um, so there's nothing special about laser powers here. Um, but this shows you that the, the dye per guide characteristics really across the whole gamut of the six that we have available now. Nova Blue 530, this is sort of this dream label that only emits uh, in the blue detector where it's desired and, and really nowhere else. Nova Blue 610, which we've talked about, uh, 660, 570, 610, and then 660. But what we have here, we've, we've been able to characterize all these labels on beads, and so we know what their brightness is, what their, what their fluorescence intensity is in the primary channel, but also notably in all of the other secondary channels. What we also have, and we did this as a, as a proxy of antigen density, is we just literally, and it's a, it's a naive way of thinking about it, but I think it's an interesting one, which is we just literally took the medium fluorescence intensities of all the positive populations here and said, okay, that'll set our dynamic range for antigen density. And what we did is permuted all of the possible panels that we could make, given an antigen density, an approximation of antigen density, and all of, the, all, all of the information that we have around the primary and then all secondary channel fluorescence. So actually, again, we commuted every single panel that you could create based on that. We mapped all possible panels. And what we did to, to characterize these is we took a sum of all of the off-channel fluorescence. And then we could look at also the sum of the primary channel fluorescence. And if you think about it, it's actually a really simple way of thinking around, well, how did you do your panel design, right? It wasn't this heuristic approach, it was actually just, I tried to create the cleanest panel available, because I can do that. And if you think about it, just a very simple two axis plot here, where you're trying to optimize for total primary channel fluorescence and limit total off channel fluorescence, you really would want to have a panel that's in the epic amazing box, right? Because you're maximizing the amount of signal you can get in the primary channel and minimizing the amount of spread that you're gonna get, right? And everything else would just really be serviceable or, or not very much. And so we're able to do that and actually compare Again, apples to apples, what if we designed a panel with our six labels using the traditional method? What could be possible if we used a, a new method here? So what we see is we do this conventional method where we just map, hey, we're gonna take the brightest and map it to the lowest antigen density. We end up with a, essentially a serviceable panel, right? One that would probably be comparable in terms of fluorescence characteristics with what's out there now. But if we use the lowest off channel method, we can actually create a superior panel, right? Um, at least based on these optimization criteria. One other note that I think was really interesting was that there are literally clusters of panels that exist out there if you permute every single one, right? So panels actually clump themselves. The panel design actually clusters. But again, one of the other challenges that we had here is remember, if you look at the way TVNK is done right now, and arguably a lot of panels, right, and we'll build this up in a moment, you're trying to spread these across multiple laser lines, right? This is off the red and, and the blue. And what we're trying to do in t with intent is stack the blue and the yellow green laser lines, right? So how can we actually stack these adjacent laser lines in a way that's just not being done right now? And so this is actually the performance characteristic, right? So the nice thing is you can literally just pick these up, you conjugate them, and then you've, you've got your panel. And then remember what I've noted around tunable brightness, then we can remember we tune the brightness. So in every case here, these are just, this is just a one, one to one, one five to one antibody. Gate on limbs and CD3, look at CD4 versus CD8, you can actually see some of the PE. So I7 is coming apart, which is, is what you expect, but hey, that's what's out there now. Um, and then you can look at uh, uh, and these NK cells versus, versus B cells. And so what we see is, yeah, we're obviously able to separate CD45. This CD3 marker that's on this Nova Yellow 570 is dim, which so probably should be tuned up, but it's performing you know, uh, pretty well. We're actually doing a much better job on the CD4, CD8 uh, separation, even though, again, we're on adjacent laser lines. And then as you'd expect, really the real challenge here is, is sort of these pesky markers that have mid-level expression, which is 16 and 56 off this Nova Yellow 660. But really the beauty of this is that we can look at a panel, run this, say we would like this to be brighter, which we can tune, and then we have a panel and we're done, right? And we validate it in a very, I think, easy to design way. So I think it puts us in the mind of, okay, what does panel design mean? So this example is just using these on their own, right? A very limited example, but one that shows, okay, you can stack these laser lines. Maybe there's some different ways of thinking around panel design. But we're going to jump from sort of this very low color example to one that we're working on quite literally right now. So these are brand new slides. And that is this march that we're doing really out to 40 and beyond colors. And so we're on really onward to 40 plus. And so the way that we're actually this is an experiment we're working on now, we've based this actually on, um, you know, Cytec's really beautiful work in the, in the 35 color space. Um, and what we've done is taken their base panel and then actually added in new markers, right? So we've actually added in our six. So what we can do is take 34 out of the 35 and then add six new markers. Again, because of this notion of this very, very clean fluorescence, we're just stacking, right? Um, and can actually expand that stacking, right? To get asked more questions around these, uh, or, or of these cells. 
So this is work that's in progress right now, but you can see the markers that we've put across the three blue and then we've added three in the yellow, right? So we can immediately get to 40 and then as you'd expect, there's a bit of a, there's a plus sign up here. So that's where we're moving. If you wanna look at what this looks like on a, on a spectral basis, this is actually what it looks like, right? So we're actually in, incorporating our labels, right? Into these more, I would say traditional high plex panels. And I think notably, remember with this notion of clean fluorescence, we're able to stack even within current uh, with even within current high plex panels. So if you're running at the, you know, 12 to 18 and you're on, you know, either this or, or another type of instrument, you can actually think about now stacking these as additions into current panels. And so, so anyway, I don't have the data uh, uh, just yet on this because we, we just finished titrating the antibodies. So, but we'll be actually, we'll be sharing this uh, uh, very, very shortly. Uh, some of these, some of these high plex experiments, but I think, you know, from a paradigm point of view, very important to think about well, how would you incorporate these uh, into current into current panels. So hopefully I've shared with you, you know, something of a, a new way to think around panel design, how we use these instruments, right, with this incredibly clean fluorescence, some other notions around like what's some of the other realistic parts of, of using these in a workflow and using them in other panels. Um, as I mentioned, the way that we're the way that we're enabling that right now um, is this through this Nova Floor conjugation kit. It's the antibody conjugation kit with the six Nova Floor labels and Nova Block. I guess it was so important. I repeated it twice on the on the on the slide. This Nova block, for what it's worth, is 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 a blocking solution that prevents some of the stickiness that you see with monocytes and macrophages with the side based dyes. So if you're working in those cell populations, you'll be very familiar with this. Or if you've ever seen PE size seven or APC size seven or the side fives bind onto those populations, now you know why. We went and characterized well what receptor is that and how can we block that. Um, and so it just leads to lower background. But that also includes that. So it includes everything. Right, very, very low number of, of hands-on steps, right? So it's probably about five minutes of hands-on time and a very few number of pipetting steps, right? Right, about four. Um, and what that enables you to do is activate an antibody, put an oligo onto your antibody, and then our labels actually conjugate directly onto that oligo. So the way we're doing this is in a six by 100 microgram, right? So you can uh, um, conjugate uh, 100 micrograms of six individual antibodies. Um, we've also enabled people with a, uh, a CD4 kit to characterize these labels. So CD4 conjugated uh, directly to all the six labels, um, you know, sent to you. And, and that's something we can you know, sort of do in very, 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 very short order. We've got a number of people who are characterizing these labels now to say, okay, well, what would this mean for panel design? And then we've also started working on um, some high volume conjugations for folks. So people who say, look, I really want Nova Yellow on this clone. So we've started working together uh, with some people on that. So, Incredibly exciting to, to see that uh, in, a, in a period of a couple of weeks. And so, yeah, so I'll stop there. I'm happy to answer any questions and, uh, and really appreciate you, uh, you attending the webinar. And my email address is here. Any questions at all, you can hit me up through either the, the uh, reminder emails that you got or, or through, through my email address here. So uh, appreciate that and uh, look forward to getting any questions you have. Have you done any, okay, so first question is in from Brenda. Have you done any conjugations to intracellular targets? We are currently working on that. It's a great question. It's one that is definitely on the sort of tip of my, the sort of tip of my like, what do I want to see next? Oh, let me just move my video here. Um, we have not done it yet. So right now we're working on conjugating our labels to FOSP3. And when we've got that data, we will post it and certainly share that. So, so not yet is the answer. Um, it's less, it's, it's the size is smaller than PE. So we're hopeful for that, but without any data, I'm not gonna say we've already done. Cool. Well, I'll hang out if you want. If you want to raise your hand or use the chat to ask any questions, I'll hang out for another couple minutes and 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 happy to happy to get there. Oh, I've got three more questions here. Is DNAs in sample an issue? Great question. The answer is no, it's not. So it is nuclease resistant. The DNAs and the nuclei or, or nucleases actually can't recognize the phyton structure, so they don't even bind. So it's a great question. It was one of the first uh, one of the first questions I had when I first saw this technology, and so we actually did a number of different DNAs incubations. Um, and uh, uh, not an issue. Um, how tightly controlled is the degree of labeling in terms of stoichiometry? Does it show lots of lot of variation? Yeah, this is a good question. And so how controlled is the degree of labeling? Um, 
very well controlled on the conjugation kit side, right? So we're looking at a degree of labeling of essentially in that three to four range when we do that, when we do that conjugation. Um, and so does it show lots of lot variation? The answer is, uh, so I guess I'm trying to think about what the lots of lot variation would be there. It'd really be antibody to antibody variation if I'm understanding your, your, uh, your question correctly. So we are the partner that's creating this, this the conjugation kit on the oligo side um, is, uh, has done hundreds of antibodies using this conjugation chemistry. Um, and it hasn't seen any lots of lot variation once that DOL is, uh, is optimized for that particular chemistry, right? So they, if they say it's going to be three to one, um, then they've seen that every time. And it, they've seen it also not interfere with the affinity of the antibody and its binding. So I think that's equally as important. So hopefully I address that question around lots of lot variation on the phyton side. We don't have lots of lot variation, right? Cause it's, they're just having an oligo oligo conjugation. Um, anonymous attendee, have you done any barcoding with these dyes? Awesome question. So we, the original experiments that we ran, we actually used a anti barcode anti primer off the arm of the phyton. So um, we've moved to a more degenerate system just to make it easier for conjugation, et cetera. So what I'd say is, you know, if that's something that's of interest, we'd love to be able to talk to you around, okay, well, what are you looking to do in terms of barcoding um, and adding them, adding them onto that? Is your example TVNK, was there any compensation applied to your panel? Yeah, absolutely. There was compensation. Um, didn't show that in there, um, but there certainly is compensation. You can't, I mean, you can't really get away from the compensation. Um, you know, there's no real good summary statistic on compensation, right? If we were to sort of add it up. Um, but you can see, for instance, that the, particularly when you had that PE degradation, PE size seven degradation that you had less, uh, less, you had less of a compensation issue with respect to CD4, CD8. So David asked, what about DNA binding dyes, any at all? Uh, good question. Similar to the question, similar to the, similar to the answer I had around this notion of anti-primer, anti-barcode, um, we have not specifically designed any DNA binding dyes, but by definition, we can design them based on the arm that hangs off the phyton. So at this point, it's really looking for a good use case to do that, um, and also understanding how flexible we could be uh, around how to target them best. So I think it's kind of a similar answer for the barcoding question and the DNA binding question. Um, can you please comment on the dyes used and the fret efficiency of the Nova dyes? Yeah, so we, um, so we do not share the component small dyes that are on the Phyton platform because um, we've actually been able to use ones that just haven't been used in flow cytometry before. Can I comment on the fret efficiency? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think we look at this in terms of sort of quantum efficiency and like how we're tuning the geometry of those labels. Um, you know, I can't comment specifically on like here is, you know, here's the, here's the number of the efficiency on the Nova dyes. Um, I just think you've, it's, it's really more about what is, you know, from an application point of view, um, you know, the spectra and, and looking at that data to show what does the cross excitation and the emission look like. Um, and, and that should give some indication of the efficiency that we're getting in between the labels. Is Nova block, okay, another great question. Is Nova block required for staining when using multiple Nova reagents in a panel? Yes, it is. Um, and so some of the labels that were, it's actually two, two different questions here that are, that are related for sure, um, is, um, I guess I have to click answer live on this. Uh, okay, cool, now I understand. Um, so yes, you do have to use, you do have to use the Nova block um, uh, because of the, some of the stickiness of some of the component labels. Um, the best way to think about that is it's most useful in the case where you're getting, where you have monocyte and macrophages um, in sample and you're getting some of that drag up that you saw. We were not gating on lymphocytes for a lot of the data that you saw. So if you saw any shoulder on the negative population, it's occurring from those monocytes and macrophages. So you can gate them out, but we recommend that you use that, not that Nova block solution in addition to it. It's the only, I would say it's, it's definitely the only protocol alteration at all, right? Uh, and you can even stain with the Nova block uh, or, or mix them up with that. How long is the phyton in terms of number of base pairs? I do not remember off the top of my head. So I remember, you know, it's 20 nanometers across, so I guess we could do the geometry, um, but I do not remember off the top of my head. So I will have to follow up with you on that answer because I just, I just do not remember it. 
Have you tested DAPI or PI bind into the flight time? Yes, so great question. So we recommend, yeah, good. Um, we recommend non-intercalating DNA dyes because it's a piece of DNA. So if you've got a DNA intercalating label, chances are it's gonna intercalate into the fight time, right? So um, I do, I trying to remember if we've actually tested DAPI or PI. I don't think the, I think the answer is no, um, not specifically, but we certainly, I think right off the bat, we went with the amine reactive um, uh, viability dyes. How large is the four flight time version usable for EVs? Yeah, so let, yeah, let's let's break that out. So the four cluster version, same geometry. Um, the the component labels really don't add much in terms of the 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 size. Has a couple of interesting conversations around EVs, right? In terms of the sizing, we're doing some work now in characterizing that on small particles. I don't have, you know, I'm a scientist, so I don't have data. I'm not going to say, oh yeah, you can try it. Uh, here, here it is. I'd say we're testing that right now on EVs and what that means for particle sizing. I'm hopeful that we could get a four cluster onto EVs very, very soon and determine what that means for the limited detection for EVs and small particles. So I don't have a good answer yet. If they're planned, great. So two questions, uh, so two related questions here. Is there a plan for additional off the shelf conjugated antibodies and then also de-anticipate Phytonics providing directly conjugated antibodies in addition to the conjugation kits. Uh, yes, it, it, yes, there has been a, a big, I'd say there's been a big push for us to get the labels, particularly the six current labels onto, onto conjugated material. The way that we're supporting that now is, is more in a, you know, if you're very interested in a particular antibody, um, we can do that conjugation for you, right? We set, you know, set a minimum at a milligram and up. Um, but yeah, I would say, Stay tuned, particularly into uh, late spring, early summer, when we're looking at what this what, what this will mean in terms of putting it onto 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 content. Um, how does Nova Block work with other solutions in stain, brilliant stain buffer, etc.? This is another one of those where you know I don't have data, so I'm not gonna. I don't really want to hand wave around like buffer compatibility. Um, we've had a lot of questions around methanol fixation, brilliant stain buffer, etc. Um, I think at least to date, what we've seen in all of our buffer testing is because of this notion of the solubility cage, the phyton is holding water very closely, so we don't expect there to be much of an effect. But again, we have not been able to do a huge amount of buffer testing um, as we've just been working on, on new label development. So um, I'd say there's a developing answer there in terms of buffer stability. Um, and I think definitely a lift from the solubility of the, of the platform, but we still have to test it. Cool. Great. Again, I'll hang out for a, a little bit longer here um, uh, and uh, to do some Q&A. And, uh, and if not, I'll, I'll certainly follow up with, uh, with folks who attend. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Brenna. Thank you all for attending, really appreciate it. Um, again, I'm gonna hang out probably for another 60 seconds or so, so if you have any questions, and uh, cool, yeah, I think you coming. Oh yeah, is the conch, there we go, nice, more questions. Love, love questions. Um, the conjugation kit is commercially available now. Yes, it is. Um, and so we are shipping those in early March. But yes, they're commercially available now in the sense that you can know, get your quote and, and move that forward. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's been fun. It's been great to see a lot of interest there. And uh, I appreciate the, appreciate the high five, Matt. Thank you, Stefan. Appreciate you, appreciate you coming. Cool stuff. I agree. Thank you. If you're having fun, you're doing it right. <laughs> 
Great. Okay. I'm going to sign off again. My email address, if you need it, actually, it's probably easier to remember info at phytonics.com <laughs> than, my, than my long last name, but really appreciate you guys attending and uh, we will record this and, uh, and I'll share with you as well. So, so thanks so much and uh, have a great day.